going on velocity banking and infinite banking. Got a case study. We're going to be combining these strategies. If you're brand new, this video probably isn't the best video for you to watch. Okay. It's a little more advanced. If you're someone that is low income, low cash flow, backs against the wall, zero cash flow, negative cash flow, bad situation, bad financial situation, you're going to want to go click on playlist when you hit my channel, go to playlist and go to velocity banking pregame work so that we can first build the foundation. I've been getting some interesting comments lately and it, it makes sense. It does. It really does make sense. But I've been seeing some comments lately and I'll read one of them. Shout out to uh, Savannah who, who often comments on my channel whenever I make or produce a case study video where the income is higher than the average and cash flow is higher than the average and maybe they're debt free or maybe there's just the mortgage remaining. They've paid off all their debt. Their expenses are low. It's really interesting the energy I get from people who make low income, right? Versus people who make low income but have a rich mindset. People who are broke but have a wealthy mindset. The, the, there's a paradigm shift that occurs. Let me know if you feel that energy uh, when you're looking through the comments section. You're seeing how people comment or maybe just in your day to day. Right. For those of you who have been practicing velocity banking now for so many years, three, four, five years or infinite banking or a bit of both, or now you're on 10 X mode and you're building a business. Do you find it interesting how the people that were with you when you were broke, low income, poor minded, you had the paradigm shift. You were the one watching 50, 100 of my videos and other content creators. You were the one reading the books going to the source. Where did this come from? Where did this strategy come from? Right. And as you began to improve yourself personally, spiritually, physically, financially, you began to elevate your mindset. You once were jealous, envious, angry. Why? why how come I can't make money or how come I'm in this position? Da, da, da. You know, daddy wasn't there and I didn't have a mom growing up or my dad left me when I was two and, and all this excuses, right? And then all of a sudden you had this paradigm shift and you begin to hold yourself accountable and you begin to not play victim anymore. And you've began to take it to the next level in your life. You begin to own your trauma. You overcame your trauma, your obstacles, your challenges. And now you're using that as, as, as a force of energy, of motivation, of passion, of encouragement, of inspiration. I mean, go down the list and now you've elevated your income. Okay. Now you are above the average. You're in the top 10%. You're in the top 20% of income in America. And all of a sudden you're now getting these weird comments, right? Weird. Like, wait a minute. Isn't that the goal to get better? Isn't that the goal to make more money, to be able to give more tithe, more do more? more impact isn't that the goal to have to build a stronger relationship with the father with the creator to be to be entrusted with god the father his resources to be trusted with more means you bear more responsibility means you're responsible for more for more of his children his people which requires more resources which requires more money isn't that the goal so it trips me up sometimes when I, I, I hear these comments and as I read the comment, I'm seeing it's there's there's pain behind the comment. There's a human behind that comment. Maybe they're a bot. I don't know. There's tons of bots nowadays, but you typically know when you're dealing with a person when there's a very, very well scripted comment. Um, so there's pain, there's struggle, there's worry, there's doubt, there's fear in this comment. And I've seen it multiple times. Maybe you were one of those people at one point and then you had the shift. I share this. I open up with this to let you know that we need to give people grace, mercy, patience. Be patient with the people that you're working with. If you're someone that's like me, you're building a financial coaching practice, you're, you're building a business, 
you're helping your family get to the next level in their finances, but they haven't had the the flip yet. They haven't had that paradigm shift like you had. Give grace, give mercy, give patience. Think back to how long it took you to watch how many videos of me before you finally said, man, there's something in the math here. There's something here. I don't know too much about this kid, but there's something in the math that just is is finally starting to add up. Okay. Give yourself that same amount of time when you're working with someone, if they haven't yet had that shift, that mindset shift. So here's the comment. This was a video I did recently. The title of the video was Velocity Banking Making 13 Grand a Month. Now, 13,000 a month is a pretty high number or really extremely high number if you're a single mom, divorced mom, widow, single dad, divorced dad, widow dad, if you're paycheck to paycheck making three, four, five grand a month, that's a lot of money to you. I get it. Understand that it truly, when I say it truly does not matter how much money you make, it's all about how you manage what you keep. Okay. So the person making in that video, 13,000 a month is just as financially illiterate as someone making three grand a month. How is that? How can that be, Denzel? Well, it's it, it boils down to simply the skills and talents and gifts or career choice that that person went through. Someone making three, four grand a month might just be a waiter, okay? Or you clean houses or you work at a hotel versus someone making 13, 15 grand a month might be a dentist, okay? They might be an engineer. They might be some type of a doctor. They might be a uh what do you call those people that put you to sleep the anesthesiologist i think they actually make more money than 13 15k a month but it's not about how much money the person is making right so in that case study i did person making 13 grand a month they did not know the strategies they were also in a tough financial position they're also living paycheck to paycheck so it's the same whether I'm talking to somebody making three grand a month, 13 grand a month, 33,000 a month, or 300,000 a month, if you're financially illiterate, or if you are a poor steward over your finances, it's all the same. I have to, I have to go back to the fundamental basics of finance, the principles, and I have to say the same thing to the person who is making multiple six figures, down to the person making low four or five figures a year. It's the same conversation, guys. So I want you to be able to expand your mindset. If you're someone that's low income, right, below the average American income salary, I want you to expand your mindset. Don't click away from a video that's showing making 15 grand a month, 17 grand a month, 10 grand a month, right? Look at that because that is typically where you want to get to, right? If you're making two, three, four, five grand a month, you're trying to jump. Yes, you're trying to make more, but also be a good steward of where you're at so that you can be entrusted with more and then entrusted with more. And that's how you go from level to level as it relates to finances, right? So here was the comment it says, how many people make 13 grand a month? Denzel, how many people? How many people? A lot of people. Totally unrealistic numbers for the average American. Anyone who has a cash flow of over four grand and a credit card balance of 6K isn't too bright. In two months, it's paid off. Like, duh. Like, duh. And I was like, oh, man, there's pain. There's struggle in that comment. I hear you. Trust me. When you guys comment, clients, non-clients, new people, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing the pain in the way you write. I'm observing. I'm just waiting patiently. I'm saying, look, I'm here. I'm here with open arms. You don't got to pay me a dime to get in my ecosystem. You just got to be willing to do the work. That's it. I'm coming in open arms, love. I'm ready. I'm ready when you're ready to surrender, when you're done delivering your hate, when you're done with your anger, look right here, open arms, right? This is the kingdom way, open, I'm ready. I'm ready to receive your love once you've, once you've poured out all your hate and you're now empty and all you got left is mercy and gratitude. I'm gonna be right here, same video, same content, same material, gotta know your numbers. What do I say guys, gotta know your numbers. What are your four major numbers? Gotta know them, gotta know them. Send me your numbers. You want to work with me? You need help? 
Send me your numbers. Send me your numbers. Don't just send me two numbers. Send me your numbers. All of them. Everything. And maybe, maybe we'll have a conversation. Because I'm going to look at those numbers and I'm going to see, okay, this person's serious. They sent me pay stubs, bank statements, numbers, goals, financial situations, dot, 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 whole story, everything. Then I'm like, you know what? This person's serious. They want to get to work. So I just wanted to open up with that as we look at a case study. And this isn't a, a high income type of case study. But as I make more videos, just understand it's all the same. Whether I'm doing a case study on someone making a million a year, 500, five grand a year, five grand a month, right? 50 grand a year, 70 grand a year. It's all the same. It's, it's up here being able to comprehend the strategy, apply that action so we can have some results, guys. All right, let's take it to the whiteboard. Took 12 minutes on that. I think it was worth it. <clears throat> now we got 58 people in the house. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of this strategy. So four major numbers on the board. Dealing with a client making 7,150 bucks a month, net take home, total expenses, everything, total. They're spending $4,150 a month. Total debt, 130,000 bucks. That debt is inside of their debt tool, which is a first lien HELOC at 5.5%. So they switched their traditional mortgage into a first lien HELOC. They now have a 5.5% rate, $300,000 credit limit, 130 owed on it, leaving them with a net cash flow consistently per month, 3,000 a month. These numbers can fluctuate. They can make more money. They can cash flow more. They can potentially spend a little bit less. These are overestimating on expenses, underestimating on cash flow, underestimating on income, leaving room for error. Four major numbers, debt tool, first lien HELOC, 300K, 5.5%. Cash on hand, 40 grand. Couple goals, couple desires. After spending so much time with me, they're like, Okay, I've heard you talk about the HSA. I've heard you talk about Roth, um, Denzel. I work in the banking industry and my exit strategy to get out of the banking strategy, uh, to get out of the banking industry. I want to be able to do what you do, Denzel. I want to coach people. I want to teach velocity banking, infinite banking. I want to build a practice out of it. I want to help people uh, pay off their debt or increase their income, start a business, right? So they're looking to start a financial coaching practice. Now in the midst of these goals, we're implementing a strategy on themselves and then simultaneously, they're gonna be marketing themselves little by little to build that coaching practice. And it's all gonna flow. All the income is gonna flow through a velocity banking and infinite banking strategy to continue to pay off debt max fund a policy or two fund different retirement accounts and build a cash flowing business so we got activity income in here passive income in here pretty much covering all the bases right all the different segments and points of views as it relates to personal finance we're going to be incorporating multiple strategies that we see on the internet because the reality today is that you guys and myself we're all looking at multiple different strategies all at once. We're getting a we're getting a gem from this person, a gem from that lady, a gem from this guy, a gem from this content creator, and you're making your own catered, customized financial freedom plan. So that's how I want to be able to illustrate case studies, and that's what I've been doing the last three, four years is really bringing all these concepts together. Because you don't have to just do one. Because we're living in a time where you're getting bombarded with so much information. So it makes sense to talk about how do we incorporate it all, not get overwhelmed, not get burnt out, not get into analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis, right? And in procrastination mode, but we actually take action on all of these different concepts, right? So that's how I'm illustrating this. So here's the layout, getting our, our numbers together to try to figure out a funding plan is the same way or the same strategy I use when we're figuring out our chunk is typically how I also figure out how we're going to fund different assets and different vehicles, right? Cash flow times 12, 3,000 a month times 12, 36,000 a year, right? Is what we cash flow, okay? 300,000 is the credit limit 
times that by 66%, two thirds, you get 198,000. 198,000 is my max capacity of leverage before I personally would feel uncomfortable in this situation. Matter of fact, because the credit line is so high compared to their income, I may not even really ever get too close to that number to begin with of the 198. And also considering we owe already 130 on the line itself. So I so in reality, my actual space is 198,000 minus 130, right? So 198,000 minus 130. So we got 68,000 of available credit in my head, right? How my clients are thinking. This is how we typically think in terms of what we can leverage, right? 68 grand being our max, right? In the cash flow of 36 grand, 12K of that is savings, right? Every single year, which is why we're at, they're at this number of 40 grand, right? Of savings. So something that they did, right? Some of, some of the things that I'm sharing already occurred, already happened. So client already moved savings into their HELOC. So it brings the 130K down to 90, right? But I'm just kind of going back in time in terms of how this all came to be, where, where we were. So here we are, 130 minus 40. Now we're at 90K owed. So that obviously adds 108,000 of space. And again, don't even plan on getting anywhere near 198,000. But this is their threshold. This is what we're looking at right i just want to put that off to the side give you those details so you can see that so when moving when moving savings goes into the heloc brings the balance down brings my borrowing cost down from the 4150 they have a solid 2000 a month that they run bills through a credit card and they are averaging uh two percent cash back rewards so we're, we know we're getting roughly 40 bucks in cash back rewards that helps offset our what our borrowing costs at the 5.5 percent all right they are doing velocity banking to pay down the debt right to pay it off but we also want to do infinite banking they want to establish a policy so how do we do both at the same time? Is there a way to use my money more than once in this situation? Absolutely. By using the equity in the HELOC, we can max fund a policy instead of funding a policy from savings, one-time use, or funding a policy on a monthly basis. Here's what's really interesting about cash value life insurance in terms of how you fund a policy. Typically, a matter of fact, it's not typically, it's all the time. If you're gonna fund a whole life insurance policy, there are additional fees and charges if you pay monthly. I just had a conversation with a client where I showed them how they could use their debt tool to max fund their policy, switching from monthly to annual, and they were gonna save a little over $300, right? So if you saved three, four, I think it was like $400 roughly in savings by switching from paying a infinite banking policy that was designed for the infinite banking concept instead of paying it monthly where the cash value performance is going to be a little bit less than if you were to pay it annually up front because now the money is growing all at once all throughout the year as opposed to like dollar cost averaging right over time so not only do they get the benefit of their cash value performance now being improved because they switched to annual but there's also a net savings in doing that and that could be in the neighborhood of three four five six seven eight hundred dollars depending on how much money we're funding in the account so whatever that savings was understand that was money that the client was already paying they're already paying for that. It was already factored into the expenses. So now that I recovered it and I'm saying fund it through the debt tool, whatever you pay in interest is less than 
what you were paying in costs to fund that account. So then, then I asked them, what's my borrowing costs? Well, nothing. Cause I didn't increase my interest because now I borrowed from something to fund something. I didn't increase my cost. No, I actually lowered it by doing that. So when we run the math and we show the, the cost of borrowing from that period of max funding, we borrow certain amount of funds. In this case, we've decided to fund a policy on client 30 K a year. So you're going to pull 30 K from the debt tool from their first lien HELOC and max fund a policy instead of paying monthly, right? Policies already in place. So they were doing monthly. We switched it around, right? Cause I didn't design the policy personally. So we switched it from monthly to annual and they saved a bunch of money just by doing that. So if you're someone that is not a client of mine, or maybe you are a new client of mine and you're coming into my coaching practice with a policy already in place more often than not i'm seeing people fund their policies on a monthly quarterly semi-annual very rare do i see people funding their policies on an annual basis why because it's not that easy to drop 30k it's not that easy to drop 50 10k whatever the number is of your max funded amount it's not that easy but we can make it more efficient if we use a debt tool and despite whatever the interest rate is if we can show the math if we can make sense of it, it may not always make sense depends on what the rate is on the tool and what we can lower that borrowing cost down to in addition to what we're getting in cash back rewards the math works out you're actually saving more money and your cash value performs better by paying it on an annual basis not bad right so that's what's occurring here we're doing velocity banking with a credit card and a first lien HELOC. We're using velocity banking to max fund an IBC policy, 30K a year, every single year. And then once the money is in there, we're now giving it a, another use, right? So we've got the income all going into the HELOC, one use. Money goes out, same money to pay bills, second use. We're using other credit card credit to run the same bills that they're going to pull out of this account to pay that account to reduce borrowing costs and get cash back rewards as the third use then we're using the same money that we saved on interest that we got in cash back rewards incoming cash flow fourth use to fund a policy 30k a year fourth use fifth use borrowing the same money which was debt on top of debt on top of debt right same money fifth use to take out a policy loan right fifth use policy loan hits the checking account six use that money gets divided up what we borrow they're going to take a policy loan nine thousand six hundred and fifty dollars we're going to max fund an hsa and max fund a roth ira that's what they want to do so hsa stands for health savings account if you didn't know roth ira pretty common that's an account where you put after tax dollars money grows tax free hsa account you get a deduction right tax deferred money goes in right you get a tax deduction on what you contributed and if used properly the money can be accessible tax free after age 59 and a half the health savings account can be used as a stream of income right based on all your medical expenses throughout the year where instead of getting a deduction on those medical expenses you would save all the receipts all throughout your years your younger years right and then you can cash in on that when you're much older in retirement as tax-free income because it's a reimbursement of all those health eligible expenses and any money that needs to be used for health because you're still going to have a health cost in fact your health costs will increase the older you get so any money in that hsa that got built up can be used tax-free for medical so you can have a, a specific type of account that covers your medical and you can control that cost all throughout your older age through that account so very strategic type of a strategy there and then the raw same thing money goes in after tax dollars now money is growing completely tax-free so when i'm older i don't have to worry about paying taxes on all that money that gets accumulated in that account right this is details that they picked up from me a little bit but then they did more research and then they came across the fire movement which stands for financial independence and retire early that's another strategy so we got velocity banking infinite banking kingdom authority in here fire strategies four strategies so far all in one because what are you guys doing you guys are watching tons of different videos tons of different contents oh my good that's a gem oh my goodness that's a gem that's a gem and we're bringing it all together to make sense so it won't don't get overwhelmed so in the fire strategy their whole philosophy is spend less than what you make 
right? Live off 50% of what you make, save the rest, open up a brokerage account, a Roth, an HSA, a 401k, max fund these things, right? Invest in real estate, save your money, invest your money, live like no one else, right? Spend less than what you make, be a minimalist, be frugal, and buy 30, 35, 40, you're retiring early, right? And you're having financial independence, financial freedom. You're, the goal with FIRE is to have passive income equal what you produce in active income. And if you do that, then you're guaranteed to be able to cover your lifestyle, your cost of living. Because if you're already living below your means, then technically speaking, you only need enough passive income to cover your cost of living. But if you want to create a, you know, additional safety in that to claim financial independence, I would want my passive income to either exceed or meet my activity income at your career, right? This person's in the banking industry, right? On the mortgage side of things. So that's their thinking. They watched additional content on top of mine. So within the fire strategy, here's another strategy within that strategy. Velocity, infinite, kingdom, fire. Here's the fifth strategy. When they fund these, the HSA and the Roth, when they max fund it each and every year through the policy, they're now going to put that money to work and they're going to do dividend investing and index investing. Okay. Dividend investing, meaning they're buying a stock that regardless of what the price of that stock is, it pays a dividend each and every year over and over again, one, two, three, whatever the percentages of a cash flow just from owning that stock. No matter what happens to the price, it's always going to pay a dividend. Index investing, regardless of what happens to the market, they're still getting a flow, right? And the whole idea is they keep putting money into it year over year over year, creates that compounded effect, money's growing tax-free, and there, the same money that they used is also growing tax-free, right? Where? In the whole life insurance contract. The cost of borrowing is getting offset by what? The fact that they switch from monthly to annual, the fact that they're running bills through a credit card, getting cash back rewards, and the fact that they're doing velocity banking in the HELOC itself to bring the 5.5% down to less than one. Did that get you excited? gets me excited, gets me pumped up. So we got a system here, a flow of no cost of borrowing. We are becoming master borrowers, master lenders on both sides of the equation, right? Creating massive cash flow over a long period of time. This is the passive strategy. In addition to all that, they've also tapped into their skills, gifts, and talents walking in their purpose, discovering what their purpose is, they believe it is financial coaching. So now they're going to develop their style of coaching and consulting and being a financial strategist. And that's going to be an additional way for them to generate more income and cash flow on top of their main career. And as they ease out of that career, right, clients in their mid, mid 40s, so we got about, say, a 10-year window or so where they want to move out of it. I, I want to usually help people within five to seven years or less get out of their have-to-work position, right? And put them into a position where they want to work and now they're working for purpose, right? Now, I have people with careers like dentists and doctors and engineers and nurses people in hospitality different industries where you love what you do right and that's cool too you love what you do but you can't do it forever so we always have to keep in mind of that like if you're working for someone but you love what you do nothing wrong with that the only issue that will arise as you get older and older is the next young person that comes in is going to be able to do what you do better, faster, more efficient, which is going to eventually push you out. And whatever your retirement plan is through that company, I can assure you is probably not going to be enough. According to inflation, taxes, cost of living, all this different stuff that comes into the equation as we get older and older. So we have to develop a strategy in the area of the work that you do that you love, can we build a social media channel? Can we become an influencer? Can we become a speaker, right? Let's say you're a 55 year old nurse. You've been nursing for the last 30 years. So you got 30 years of expertise in the nursing industry, in that state, in that county, 
could you not become a speaker at universities that are training the next generation of nurses and get paid five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars just to speak and share your story and your experience the do's and don'ts of nursing the pitfalls that people tend to make when they first start their nursing career you know you can talk about burnout you can talk about how being a nurse you're going to be doing these 15 16 hour shifts one of the ways that i right this is you the nurse 55 year old 55 year old nurse talking you could say something along the lines of hey instead of taking adderall right you can take this all natural no gmo whatever you want to say right i i do this that gives me the energy to last those 15 16 hour shifts instead of taking adderall so now you're now you're striking chords because the next generation you already know they're they're doped up on adderall everyone's taking adderall now right oh you didn't know okay well now you know so now you get to speak on that corporations universities organizations nonprofits, businesses will hear about you and say okay you hear that lady talk about adderall and how da, 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 and, and an, an alternative strategy to that and how to last longer in the workplace and how to be mindful of all those overtime shifts that you take and instead of you know drinking away your sorrows that you can actually you know become a part of a women's ministry or men's ministry or a small group ministry where you can get you can have your thirst quenched by the spirit of the father and da, 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 and just go into it so now you're continuing to do what you love as a nurse but you've generated another stream of income that pays you at a much higher rate than you could ever physically work for and then you take that cash flow run it through your velocity banking an infinite banking system like this person here right so here we go we got let's do a recap in terms of how we got to the 30k a year number right considering that the person had capital cash flow times 12 is 36 grand right so 36,000 times two-thirds a more conservative number technically would have been twenty three thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars from the cash flow now because we have cash on hand and because of the projections that we're making for the client in terms of them building that other stream of income and other factors of raises promotions things like that that comes down the line we created a little space right to allow additional funding so naturally i would have been around 20 23k funding per year that's conservative if we're going to incorporate leverage in order to not over leverage ourselves we want to be mindful of what our cash flow times 12 is per year and what is our leverage capability the line of credit is at now 90k add 30 we're at 120 so i'm still nowhere near that 198 the amount of time it takes me to bring that 30k back down 12 months later to then do it again the preceding year the number will be less than 90 right because the cash flow is 36k and then the potential of all the other things that come into the equation that can improve the numbers over time and even if it just went back down to 90 they are okay with servicing that amount of debt okay they're comfortable with that so we don't have to go to zero necessarily because their strategy has shifted from just paying off debt to now paying down debt and max funding policy and borrowing from policy to max fund retirement accounts etc cetera, etc cetera. see what see where i went with that so that's how we got to that 30k number 12k a year of savings right so i said okay 12 12 000 plus 9650 which will get borrowed out we're at 21650 and then they felt comfortable leveraging the other seven to nine k through the debt tool because of the low cost of borrowing and that's how we kind of got to that number here's the other cool part when it comes to max funding a policy they don't have to commit to 30k a year their base premium is somewhere around three thousand bucks right three maybe four when you tack on the pua and term charges right so their required funding is only going to be the base premium anything above that is puas that money can get dumped in whenever it's just ideally we're shooting for annual funding annual funding also, when you factor in the cash on hand of the 40K, that also said that helped them get to that 30K number where it was like, okay, technically speaking, even without the HELOC, I could max fund this policy with cash flow 
and savings for the next four years. So we got the next four years secured of 30K, 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 30K. And in those four years, can they build a financial coaching practice that could potentially exceed the amount of money they make working? And then their purpose will actually force them to quit their nine to five, which gives them 40 more hours per week to work on their purpose. And that could potentially double whatever they're making here. So they can probably do like a jump to like 14K a month. Do you guys see how that can occur, right? So as we get through this strategy here, money, all income goes into HELOC, expenses go out. Before those expenses go out, a portion of it is being ran on a credit card and then it gets paid off in full each and every month from the HELOC. Money comes out of the HELOC, automatically pays that credit card, right? Because it's a first lien, HELOC works just like a checking account. So bills never actually have to come out of the HELOC into a checking account and then the checking account pays the bill. That's not what occurring here. Notice how I showed HELOC directly funds policy. It didn't have to exit somewhere and then fund the policy it just goes right in. So that means when they take a policy loan, it'll go where? Back into the HELOC. So all money goes in, expenses go out, cash flow stays, velocity banking. We set the anniversary date of funding, boom, 30K annual funds the policy. As soon as that policy is funded within 10 days of the first year and then every year thereafter, I can take out money any time of the year that I want. So we take out a policy loan. What are we borrowing for? What's the purpose of borrowing? They're simply borrowing to max fund these two types of accounts. That's it. HSA and Roth. Boom. They're doing fire strategy, dividend investing, index investing. They're shooting for rates of returns that are higher than whatever their cost of borrowing is on the policy loan, even though they already offset it. We're offsetting it double time, right? From there, as the person does velocity banking from the time of borrowing that loan to the next anniversary date they're just doing velocity banking in the heloc and they're going to continue to there's, there's no chunking going on why because there's no other debt the debt is in the debt tool so they're just consistently doing velocity banking bringing that balance down right for the next 12 months the only time they're pulling money out of the heloc in a big chunk form is for the policy so by year two if I did a $9,650 loan times, say, 4% is the loan cost internally in the policy. So that'll be $386. By year two, this is what we would like to do. Max fund the policy, 30 k plus pay interest of the 386 Out of pocket, don't let the cash value pay your loan interest. You pay it out of pocket from the debt tool itself. So now you're paying in year two, 30,386. Now, here's the other thing. If the person produced more cash flow in those 12 months, like Denzel, I actually have 35K to dump in. Cash flow increased to 3,300 a month since the first policy year, right? Well, we could take that difference and pay down the loan. At some point in time, we do want to be able to replenish the loans and then rinse and repeat and do it all over again, right? What we don't want is to never pay back the policy loans. I don't technically want to do that. I don't want to say never. And I also don't want to let the interest compound itself. So that's why we're always going to take care of it year over year. So let's say in year two, they had an extra 5K, which pays down that policy loan of 9,650. So now only 4,650 is owed. But in year two, what did they do again? We took out another 9,650 to max fund the two accounts. So add the two. Now they're at 14,300 in policy loans times say 4%, right? Cost of borrowing in one year, simple interest, right? Year three, 30K plus interest. So they're gonna pay in 30,572. Let's say year two, they've got some, quite a few clients under their belt now. They're making a second stream of income through activity. Maybe they got licensed to sell policies. Maybe they got a license to sell health insurance. Maybe they are promoting annuities. Maybe they're, maybe they set up a relationship with a credit repair expert and a, and a business credit repair expert. So they're getting referral payouts, you know? Or maybe they hooked up with a business coach. So they're on the financial side and then they 
pass the client over to business coaching if that client wants to start a business and that coach charges x and pays you a referral commission so now you're tacking on additional streams of income maybe this person decides to start a, a shopify store and now that's creating 500 bucks a month a thousand bucks a month if that may be more see how it just keeps compounding itself so year three let's say that number increased to 10k and whether they have this additional funds or not will not affect the cash value performance which is nice because they're take caring they're taking care of the interest each and every year and they are max funding each and every year and the cost to do that is near nothing right and then we can also prove that right simply running the numbers seeing okay what does it cost to uh run that debt through the HELOC all right let's see balance was originally at 90 and then when I take out 30 goes to 120 times 5.5 percent so that's 18 bucks a day then 120 minus income times interest rate or 17 all right so we got 120 is the highest balance minus income is the lowest balance in that month uh, take out expenses 4,150 117 times 5.5 17 dollars 63 cents i don't have to count this number because i'm never going to owe 120 because the moment i took money out right i dumped income in to bring the balance down so i could just go over these two numbers to try and give myself somewhat of a estimate of what it'll cost 17 dollars 63 cents a day plus 17 bucks five by two times 30 519 dollars 45 cents is my cost of borrowing in one month overestimate times 12 we're at six thousand two hundred thirty three dollars forty two cents the, the the most amount possible that i'll pay in interest that's not going to be the case but that is the most amount of money i could pay right now from here it's kind of tough to project what we'll earn in here and the roth but we know for a fact that when I fund a policy in the first year, it's negative. So we don't even have to like count whatever that is, but it's going to be a negative. 30K goes in, I have less than 30 to start with. It'll take me five to seven years or so for that or less for that money to break even, right? And there's a cost of borrowing of 386 in the policy loan itself, right? So 386 plus cost of borrowing in the HELOC itself, right? And we want to tack on that number see okay it's the total absolute max amount this is not the number they'll pay nowhere near it but this is the absolute total amount of money we'll pay right in the first year so to bring that number down we've got 40 bucks cashback rewards and that's conservative they're actually doing more but again conservative so that's 480 bucks there when you do velocity banking month over month over month the 519 starts to decrease right so i'm not paying 519 each and every month it's going to be 519 then maybe 508 then 499 then 482 right it keeps going down and down let's say from the 3650 what does the s p what does it historically have done right they, they throw these averages out i think it's like nine percent or something like that right so let's cut the number in half and say four and a half three thousand six fifty times a four point five percent rate of return that's actually not even attractive could do way better but i'm just gonna lowball it tremendously and see if it makes sense is it worth doing it right you get to be the decision of that you get to be the decision maker of that i can tell you that no matter which way you slice this whole strategy you will most likely be negative in terms of your cost of borrowing technically speaking negative in the first maybe year or two because of the way the policy is the way we pay for whole life insurance right there's a cost to do that so you're also factoring in what was that cost the pua charges right insurance companies front load the cost in the first few years but if you were to map it out how many years later when do i break even and now i start to create a positive and then when you factor in wait a minute wait a minute even though i'm negative in cost i'm also using the same dollars so many times over 
that I solved for so many different things, how do you put a value on that? I don't know, I haven't figured it out yet. Maybe you will, but how do you put a value on figuring out the whole idea of using $1 more than once and how it satisfies different equations, different uses, it's the same dollar. So if I wanted to fund an HSA and a Roth account, I could do that without having an IBC policy. No doubt, I have clients that do that. But this scenario, they're using the same dollars to fund that policy, to then take from it, to then fund two other accounts, and the money came from debt originally, right? And then the savings and the income helped reduce that cost. And year over year, my income, my mindset is to elevate and increase. Uh, I'm gonna be in a really uh, interesting position here. So we got 164.25 on 3,650, and then the Roth IRA, let's say there's a 5% rate of return on that. That's 300 bucks on that. And then through velocity banking, let's say we're able to cut the 6,233.42. Let's say we're able to cut $2,000 in borrowing costs, potentially, all right? Again, underestimating on actual cash flow that they bring in, underestimating on income. We don't factor that stuff in there. That improves the numbers even better. So 6233.42 minus two grand. Let's say we're able to bring the borrowing cost down to 4,500 bucks for the year. Granted, that number could be way less. So 480 plus 16425 plus 300. So 94425. Where does that leave us? 4500, 94425. Brings us down to 3555.75 cents. You're still negative, right? Just did all that damn work. Does it make sense? Say yes, comment yes, no Denzel. This is why you're a scam artist Denzel. This is why I don't like you. Cause you're, you know, you're a clown. You think you know everything. Dude, let me know. Cause I'm always willing to improve my strategy, right? If you were to map this out and go seven years, 10 years, 15 years, understand that there's a guarantee that the policy itself will break even. That's the first thing. The second guarantee, it's gonna start producing a positive internal rate of return between three, four, near upwards of 5% on money that was already going to leave your economy and you recaptured it. And then you gave it a second purpose and sent it out to go invest. So you're gonna eventually be netting an internal rate of return of three to 4% over here, IRR, and there's guarantees in the policy to prove that as well as non-guaranteed dividends to make up for the difference. So you got that. Every single year, you're max funding your HSA and your Roth, so now compounding starts to occur in that. So what seems like low numbers here eventually starts to really accumulate and understand that the borrowing costs in the policy, it went up a little bit, right? But if I make more income, then I can bring that down by simply dumping more money into the account. And then the HELOC itself, right? If we were to go 12 months out, the balance on the HELOC will likely be less than 90K. So if it was if it went down to 80K in 12 months, you went from 120,000 owed down to 80 and you did another 30K chunk. Well, now we're at 110. So that means this borrowing cost in year two is gonna drop. And maybe you're still negative. But then you do it again in year three, and now you've been able to bring it down to a net zero on the HELOC itself. You still got a cost in the policy, let's say, of the of the loan interest. You still have to pay out of pocket. But then maybe by year four, the HSA and the Roth are starting to pick up in returns. The IRR just went to a positive 0.5% return. Income went up, right? Cash flow went up. A lot of different variables here. So it may be worth it to you if you're thinking long term. If you're thinking short term, the strategy is not going to work, right? Guaranteed, not going to work. And then we didn't even factor in the activity income over here of running a financial coaching practice. How much money can they make here? An additional 10,000, an additional 20,000. I'm talking profit, net profit, an additional 10, 20,000 in profit on top of their income. What could that do to the whole strategy, right? First off, that money is going to get deposited into the HELOC, all that free cash flow and profit from this business. It'll move right into the first lien, brings that cost down, right? And then slowly but surely, that balance begins to go down to zero. And when it does, 
we no longer have to use it. So the goal is to wean ourselves off of the HELOC. We don't want to stay there forever, right? Why keep paying 5.5? If you, if you pay it off completely, we no longer need it. And now you have a fully funded, maybe a hundred, 150 plus thousand dollar policy that when you borrow from it, there's a wash in terms of loan interest versus what you're earning in the policy. There's a wash potentially then you don't need to borrow from it no more unless you've got a bigger project. For example, 300K and you want to take 150 to put down on a property, you know, or a real estate syndication or a franchise business of some sort or invest in an opportunity of some sort. Different story. Then we could just do velocity banking and you would just have to map out the numbers. Well, whatever the, whatever the variable rate is on that HELOC, we want to make sure that whatever we invested in is going to earn maybe double that 10 plus percent 15 percent right return so that my net is still positive no cost of borrowing and you got a three hundred thousand dollar open line of credit there at your disposal for the next 10 15 years however long the draw period is right so that's the case study that's the strategy you can put this into your own numbers. This is going to be most ideal. This type of strategy and flow is going to be most ideal for people over a little bit above average American income salary. You know, you're in the 80 and 90 hundred K range income. If you're only making 30, 40, 50 K a year, when you start looking at the cost it may outweigh the the value it may not make sense right plus maybe your mindset isn't fully developed to handle this type of a complex strategy because you're still trying to pay off credit card debts and personal loans understand this person before doing all this paid off all their cars paid off all their credit cards paid off all their student loans and personal loans they don't have anything just the mortgage itself of the 130. that's all that remained and that's why they felt comfortable to then go ahead and say, yeah, I'm ready to take that next step and amp myself up. And they also have the mindset of increasing the top line, right? Building that financial coaching practice and serving people. That's all.